welcome as we gather, or not gather as the case may be, but it is Palm Sunday. Luke says, quoting from the Old Testament prophet, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Make way, make way for Christ the King in splendor arrives. pray and we'll gather up our prayers in the words of the Lord's Prayer, the form of the Lord's Prayer that we're using, and the words for that will appear on the, the screen at the time. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we greet you today as the Word made flesh, the one who is before all, beyond all, within all, and the one in whom all things have their being, and yet the one who entered our world, came into our time, our space, sharing our humanity, experiencing the joys and the hurts of flesh and blood. He came living and dying among us that we might share in the joy of your kingdom. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. We greet you as the Messiah, the Son of David, King of Israel, servant of all, Savior of all, anointed for burial, crowned with thorns, and lifted high in a cross, your kingdom not of this world. Blessed is a king who comes in the name of the Lord. We greet you as Lord of the empty tomb, the risen Christ, victorious over death, triumphant over evil, the one who has gone before us, whose spirit walks with us now, and who will be there to greet us at our journey's end. Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. We greet you as the King of kings, Lord of lords, the ascended and exalted Lamb of God, ruler of the ends of the earth, enthroned in splendor, seated at the right hand of the Father, and worthy of all honor and glory and blessing. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Lord God, we claim to be your followers. We call you king of our lives. But all too often, that is not what we put into practice. When you look at our lives, the weakness of our faith, the frailty of our commitment, you must grieve over us as surely as you wept for Jerusalem long ago. Have mercy on us. 
Forgive us all the ways we fail you. Forgive us when we don't see the values of your kingdom. Don't see our world, our lives through the values of your kingdom. We want to bring you honor, but so often we do the opposite. Have mercy on us. Now we throw ourselves in your grace. We ask, Lord God, that you accept our service despite our sins. Rule in our hearts and use us for your glory. In Jesus' name, and hear us as we gather up our prayers in his words. Our Father in heaven. first Palm Sunday was a really noisy affair. Crowds had come out. They were cheering and shouting as Jesus entered Jerusalem. And today we can't gather to be making noise to greet the King. We meet our own homes at different times. On that first Palm Sunday, Jesus noted that even if the crowd were silenced, the very stones, not the rolling stones, but the stones around the, the place, they, they would shout out, well, it's nothing as miraculous that we've done, but the wonderful root of technology means that we can, of sorts, be together and gather together. Now, in the past two Sundays when we've um, done this, we've left aside our series in Isaiah, uh, focusing on particular passages and thinking about them in the light of the coronavirus epidemic. But today we want to return to our passages in, in Isaiah, and they speak to our context and also speak to the fact that it is Palm Sunday. There are three contrasts that we're going to look at, and as we do so, it'd be very helpful to have your Bibles open at Isaiah 53. So if you've got, not got that now, then good chance to press the pause button, go and find yourself a Bible, and have it open at Isaiah chapter 53. Today's reading is taken from Isaiah chapters 53 and into 54, and it's going to be split into three different parts. First part is chapter 53, reading from verses 7 to 9. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. The first of the contrasts are noise and silence. We've been having a lot more silence around the place these days, haven't we? Life's been a lot quieter. Maybe seen on television sometimes the pictures of shopping centres or main streets and towns deserted, roads that are usually chock-a-block at rush hour, been remarkably empty. Palm Sunday, by contrast, as I said, was noisy. But by the end of the week, by the end of the week that began with Palm Sunday, it got a lot quieter for Jesus. After the noise of the crowds, after the hullabaloo of clearing the temple during the week, we moved towards the end of the week to a far quieter picture of Jesus praying in Gethsemane. And then his arrest, followed by a trial, and even at that trial, the issue of silence comes up. This had been seen in the prophecy of Isaiah and seen in these verses that Margaret read to us a few moments ago. So verse 7 of Isaiah, 
He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. And then again in verse 9, he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And so there's a big emphasis on the silence of Jesus, and so it turned out. Matthew, in describing what had happened in chapter 27 of his gospel, says, when Jesus was accused by chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. And then Pilate asked Jesus, don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. And not only was the suffering servant and Isaiah prophesied to be silent, not only did Jesus do that at his trial, Isaiah had noted too, verse 8 of the reading, that other people were going to be silent as well. Who of his generation protested? And sure enough, the disciples had cleared off. People were silent. Now, the point really is, that Jesus was not in any way going to try to avoid what was ahead of him. Even as he rode into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday, even as the crowds were cheering and welcoming him, he knew what was coming. He knew what was ahead. And he headed straight for it. The judicial processes had said that Jesus was innocent. They looked for evidence, we're told, but in Mark 14, but they did not find any. And Luke tells us in chapter 23 that that was Pilate's assessment as well. I find no reason to put this man to death. And yet the whole shoddy business went ahead. Jesus was condemned. The world tried to do away with him, to push him to the side, to have him silenced. Now, the fact that you're turning into a service suggests that you're wanting to welcome Jesus, to praise Him. But that, that is not our whole story either, is it? For each of us have on occasion, maybe not in any determined and set way, but lapses and falls, we've lived our lives as if Jesus didn't matter very much at all. The silence of Jesus speaks powerfully of his willingness to die in our place. Our silence, having no excuses, speaks powerfully of our need for him to die in our place. Now, Jesus was doing something unique. Only the sinless could die for sinners. Only the Son was able to bear the Father's wrath. But he was also giving us an example to follow. The early followers of Jesus knew what it was to be persecuted for following Christ. Folks making, f and, f and today it might be slightly different for us, but there are still challenges. People who make fun of Christians. Stories stirred up to criticize the church or Christians. There are still folk being picked on for being followers of Jesus. People experiencing the tension of serving Jesus and yet attending to others that we love but who have no interest in following Jesus and who sometimes wonder why we bother with them. Now, what do we do when we come under threat? Of course, the virus has produced one kind of threat, but I mean particularly and personally when you are challenged, and in particular challenged for being a follower of Jesus. Do you try to fight back, or do you try to get out of the way? You see, the thing is, in the story, Jesus does neither. Jesus' silence is to do neither the running away nor the fighting back and fighting fire with fire. Now, First Peter, the letter written by Jesus' disciple, was written to a suffering church. And he mentions these kind of ordinary scenarios. 
He says, it is God's will by doing good that you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. He says, slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. You see what he's saying? In these ordinary, everyday relationships at work, in the family, or amongst people among whom we mix, we are neither to be people who deny Jesus by not saying anything and running away, nor are we to deny Jesus by fighting back fire with fire. And the thing is, Peter knew, not just from the teaching and example of Jesus, But he knew how this all fitted together because in verse 22 at 1 Peter 2, he says, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. That is, he quotes the ninth verse of Isaiah chapter 53. This is who Isaiah was talking about. This is what Jesus lived out. This is what you and I are to live out. So when someone says to you, you're just a hypocrite like these other Christians, when someone says to you things like, oh, you're just a stuck up so-and-so. When someone says to you, oh, these kind of fairy tales, why do you believe them? What are we to do? Not pass, fight insult with insult. Not do nothing. But Peter says, and Jesus' example is, that we are to be winning over evil with good in whatever ways that we can. Now, that's not easy for us to do. But I want us to think about how we might put that into practice. We're going to hear a verse of how deep the Father's love being played for us. And as that verse of the music's being played, think, what do I do when I'm challenged about my faith? What do I do if my Christianity is criticized? Do I fight back or do I flee? And let us ask God to give us both the wisdom and the strength to overcome as Jesus overcame. Let us ask God to give us the wisdom and give us the strength to win over as Peter talks in chapter 2 and 3, but the purity and reverence of our lives. Now for the second part of the reading. 
reading from verses 10 through to 12. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong. Because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Our second contrast is the contrast between being brought down and lifted up. At the end of our last short section on Isaiah, there was a clue about what was to come. We're told in verse 9 that Jesus was assigned a grave with the wicked, and incidentally the word wicked is in the plural, and yet he was with the rich in his death, and the word for rich is in the singular. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that Hebrew poetry often has parallels or couplets where the same thing is said in order to reinforce the point. And so it might be something like, and the poetry here is not any good, it might be something like, the devastation caused by the fire was terrible. The fire had ruined everything. You see, that it's the same thing not being said twice for emphasis. And that's what we would have expected here in verse 9. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, but it's with the rich in his death. It's, it's a contrast. It's a, almost a contradiction, we might say. Now, I have no idea. I sometimes wonder what Isaiah thought he was meaning when he wrote these words down. But hundreds of years later, we find them coming true. Hundreds of years later, we find that Jesus is given a a commoner's death with the horror of crucifixion. He's crucified, crucified between two thieves on the cross. He's just about to be assigned a grave, a common grave with the wicked, just chucked into a pit. When Joseph of Arimathea steps forward, Joseph, who was rich and who had a family tomb that had not yet been used and that he wanted to be for Christ. And so indeed, as Isaiah prophesied all these years before, Jesus indeed was assigned a grave with the wicked in the plural, but was with the rich, singular, in his death. And that contrast is carried on into verses 10 to 12, And again, it must have been bizarre for Isaiah as he was writing down that it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to to suffer. And yet, the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. He will see the light of the life and be satisfied. So what is it, Isaiah might be thinking, is it crushed or is it honored? And in fact, it's both. For the way of Jesus involves that way of suffering en route to glory. Here is why we can have hope even in the most discouraging and difficult of times. God loves totally. And God will overcome and bring His people, His servants, to a place of overcoming. Christ indeed suffered, but now is satisfied. He died for His people, but yet, verse 10, now lives to see His offspring. And after He went through the anguish, After he was marred and pained, disfigured, despised, rejected, punished, pierced, crushed, wounded, oppressed. And incidentally, all of these words are said of the servant and in that short chapter of Isaiah 53. Anguish, marred, pained, disfigured, despised, rejected, punished, pierced, crushed, wounded, oppressed. After all of that, he's vindicated by the Father. And he lives to see the fruitfulness of his sacrifice. And notice that the fruitfulness of his sacrifice, verse 12, is not that he himself is given all kinds of acclaim and medals and everything else, but that he's able to share the spoils with his people. 
people for whom, the end of verse 12, he prays. The promise is not that the servant gets promotion and esteemed all by himself, but that the servant has riches for his people. And so opposition and evil do not get the last word for us. Coronavirus will not have the final say. Even those who have had their lives taken by the virus, some of them, not all will have been Christians, but some of them who have been in Christ will one day rise again for all eternity. And they will be where there are no viruses, where nothing can inflict and nothing can oppress. For opposition and evil will not get the last word. Those whose faces are turned against God and turned against His gospel will not triumph. And so even though there are times when we are brought low, if we're in Christ to Himself, verses 10 to 12 went that way, then there is more and there is better to come. And the great portion that Jesus gets, verse 12, He divides amongst His offspring, amongst His people. Well, again, we're going to hear a verse played of how deep the Father's love. And again, it's a time for us to reflect and to pray about that experience of being crushed, of being set upon. I think perhaps in this time of the uh, virus being so prevalent, it's not a time for the church to give easy and quick and facile solutions and answers. It's a time for us to learn more about how to lament and indeed how to repent. And to ask ourselves whether we have the faith and the resolve to stay in the place of suffering and questioning so that we might be raised up by God. Can we do that as individuals and as a church? Can we wait on the Lord, lamenting, repenting, and seeking His raising us up to do that with trust and with hope? Let us pray and ask God's help to do so. the last part. Chapter 54 verses 1 to 3 and it's entitled The Future of Zion. Sing, barren woman, you who never bore a child, burst into song, shout for joy. You who were never in labour because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent, Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. For you will spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. Amen. Our third, our final contrast of the three from the first few verses of Isaiah chapter 4, 54, sorry, is the contrast between barren and fruitful. 
Now, one of our church members here at Clermont posted on Facebook the other day that uh, she woke up one morning and went downstairs and found that there was an extra cat in the house. A cat had come through the cat flap and made itself at home. Quite a surprise, I suppose. But how much more of a surprise? Imagine just how, how much greater a surprise it would be if we got up one morning, went into the living room and found that there was a lot of children there. Umpteen new children had come to the house. Where did they come from? Who brought them? Did we give birth to them overnight? Surely we would have remembered if we had. Where had they come from? Who'd been feeding them? And where on earth are we going to put them? There's not room for another 20 or 30 kids in the house. Well, that, says Isaiah in chapter 54, is what's going to happen to God's people. They had seemed to be barren. But now they were, verse 2, going to have to enlarge the place of the tent, stretch the tent curtains wide, because there's more and more coming, more and more of God's people, and the barren are going to be fruitful. The story of God's rescue in the world begins with a barren woman. Back in Genesis chapter 12, the wife of Ab Abram, Sarai, is, is barren, and yet the promise is there that through Abram, there are going to be so many descendants, more than the stars in the sky. And in many times since, there have been barren periods. The church in the Western world in our era is going through something of a barren period. And we might think when we're in these times that a recovery, a growth, or an expansion of the people of God is as likely as, as likely as the stones shouting out on Palm Sunday. But that, Jesus said, is what God can do, and if needed, would do. And in fact, transforming barrenness is what God has done time and again, starting with Sarai. Now, of ourselves, we are barren. Of ourselves, we cannot bring gospel life and transformation to the world. That is God's work. But our part is to sow, to share, to serve, to love, to trust in the promises of God, and if need be, suffer for them. Now, I think among the lessons of this time dominated by the virus, among the lessons is the one that we do not see well enough what is ahead. It's been one of the criticisms, particularly this week, isn't it? We didn't anticipate. We didn't get enough um, ventilators or masks or whatever provided. There's a lesson that we're not strong enough for everything and that we're not as independent and self-managing as we thought we were. And the epidemic is to some extent, and, and I wish there was more of, of this going on, the epidemic is to some extent making folk ask questions about what really matters. Some are saying, do we really want to return to normal? Was normal really for the best? Surely when we go back to whatever it is, we want to make it different. And indeed so. There's a lesson that we need to learn through this time. There is something that we need, that we need to be brought to our senses. There's something that we need to learn or relearn about what really matters and about what is most important. And you see, the sad truth is we don't learn stuff like that overnight. And it takes a work, and it takes a miracle of God. It takes God to be in action to make the barren fruitful. But God's committed to that, and He calls us to play our part in that. We need to realize that it is through service and through suffering that love grows, that love is made strong. And I think one of the reasons for the apparent frailty of the church in the Western world today is that we want Palm Sunday and we want Easter, but we don't want to face up to what's in between. We want the experience of the crowd and the joy and the celebration. We want to hear the stories of new light coming and things growing again. And we want that without the suffering, without the tragedy, 
without all the toing and froing and seriously op- op- opposing aspects that were going on between those two Sundays. We don't want to live in the place where we resist without fighting or fleeing. We don't want to experience the experience of being brought low so that we might later know resurrection. Humanly speaking, that's not attractive. But this is the mystery of the cross, and we'll be exploring more of this in the coming days in Holy Week. And it's the way of Jesus Himself. He knew what was ahead of him that Palm Sunday as he arrived in Jerusalem. And he still allowed the welcome and the celebration and the Palm Sunday party to go ahead. I'm sure it gave Jesus strength for what lay ahead. He probably needed that kind of encouragement because he's one of us and he wouldn't love the idea of suffering. He went ahead with it, though, because he knew he was walking in the way of the Father. And he was willing, as the writer to the Hebrews puts it, for the joy that was set before him to head into and wait in the seemingly barren place. And he did so because he lived in anticipating, anticipation of sharing so much for so long with the people of God for all time. Seriously, that's a word and a challenge for the church today. Yes, enjoy Palm Sunday. Yes, enjoy Easter Sunday. But don't think we can enjoy them without the experience, too, of what was in between. And learning that in those difficult days, God was still there, just as as much as He was on the Sundays. God was still working His purposes out, just as much as He was on the Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. Because the gospel, by its very nature, is, is that turning of the tables, where the barren woman sings, verse 1 of Isaiah 54. She bursts into song and shouts for joy because she has so many children. The tent needs to be enlarged. They're going, people are going to spread out to the right and the left. The descendants will be so many and they will dispossess nations and, and set, settle in desolate cities because our God will not give up but neither must we, neither should we. Can we say, neither will we? Amen. Now, for this series on Isaiah, we've been very grateful to um, a book that was written by Tim Chester called The Beauty of the Cross that has been Um, helping um, through the studies, but also in addition to writing the book, uh, Tim Chester also wrote the words of a hymn, and we're going to sing that hymn now, See Jesus Stripped of Majesty. And after the singing of that hymn, we'll confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed, and then it'll be our prayers for others. Return to 
I believe in God. Son Jesus into the world to be an example to us. Help us to walk in his steps and to walk in humility so that we too may serve with no expectation of reward. In his forgiveness so that we too forgive as we hope to be forgiven. In his courage so that nothing will ever deflect us from the way we ought to go. And in his endurance so that nothing will discourage us from reaching the goals that you have set for us. In response, we bring our offerings of time and money and ask that you bless them and that they are used locally and nationally to bring the news of Jesus to people who have not heard of him and to grow your kingdom here on earth. Father, we think of your church at this time as we move into Holy Week and ask that you bless your church Make your church here and all over the world a real fellowship in which there are no quarrels and no divisions, no distinctions of race or colour, of party or class, a fellowship in which all are really one. And help us in our church to work and pray to make Clermont like that. Be with our ministry team as they bring your word to us week by week. We pray that the spirit of understanding and wisdom and the spirit of counsel and knowledge rests upon Gordon, Stephen, Miriam and Murdo. You have anointed them to preach the gospel and we confess that we will stand behind them and support them in prayer. Help us to forget ourselves and to remember others. Help us to reach out during this pandemic to help our neighbours and community by going for messages by sharing what we have with those who have little, or by being a friendly voice at the end of a telephone for people who cannot leave their houses and are feeling isolated and alone. Help us to share the love you have shown for us. Please with those people who are ill and in pain, those who are waiting in an operation 
or a consultation or diagnosis that have now been postponed due to the coronavirus outbreak. Bless them all and support them through these worrying times. Be with those who are hungry and cold and have no home. Bless the organisations who are providing shelter and food at this difficult time. Bring reassurance to those who have no job or are worried about losing their job because of the situation the country is facing just now. There is a lot weighing down on everyone just now, but our country and world will prosper again. All too often we take other people for granted, but this pandemic has shown us just how much we depend on each other. We thank you for the work that has been undertaken in all parts of the NHS and within research facilities to either care for people who have coronavirus or are looking for ways to combat the virus. We thank you for the people involved in producing our food, packaging it, delivering it to our local stores and then serving the public. We thank you for the work that goes on to keep the power supplies going to our houses so that we are warm and secure. Bless all the key workers who are keeping our country going through these difficult times. Let them all know that they are appreciated and supported. And as we enter Holy Week, we thank you for Jesus, who is the pattern of our lives, the companion on our way, and the saviour of our souls. This we ask for his love's sake. Amen. Before we sing our closing hymn, to remind folks that um, the coming week is Holy Week, um, we've usually gathered uh, each evening, weekday evening, through Holy Week um, for a half-hour service. We can't do that, of course, this year, but we are um, putting the services out on the internet, and they'll be available each night from 7 o'clock. So as many as wish to, as many as can, we'd love to have you join with us um, as we go through more of these contrasts and contradictions of the way God brings about salvation, but nevertheless the good news of just how that salvation is good for us. We hope too to have a bit more um, uh, organized in time for Easter and the celebration of Easter, particularly looking at something for uh, younger folks, for children, maybe patch prays or so on. Um, there'll be information about that in our um, midweek email, midweek messenger, which comes out on Wednesday. If you don't get that email and you'd like to, just um, let us know by emailing us at office at claremontparishchurch.co.uk. But also we put the Midweek Messenger on the Claremont Parish Church Facebook page, so you'd be able to get it there and find out a bit more of what's on. Finally, just to say that um, just before we recorded the service last week, I had got word of the death of Gene Anderson of Glenn Burvey. Um, and just to let folks know that Jean's funeral is going to be this coming week um, on Wednesday morning. Um, again, the um, effects of the coronavirus are um, all too, too real and there's only going to be a handful of us allowed to be at the funeral service and the family have asked them we'll explore the possibility of doing something later at Claremont when this is all behind us. But do remember Jean's family in particular um, in your prayers and in particular as we gather on Wednesday morning for Jean's funeral. And our closing hymn, we've read today parts of uh, Isaiah 53 and Isaiah 54. And for our closing hymn, we just go a wee bit further on from Isaiah chapter 55. You shall go out with joy. And after we've sung this, we'll share together in the saying of the grace. <laughs>